preserving waterways. Not all timber stands are going to have a waterway, natural waterway running through their property, but if they do, you can see that this is, this, you want to keep it as natural as possible so you can protect that water table. Uh, generally, that's called an SMZ. It does require a special application on file uh, accompanying your normal application because this is a different designation within our system. It lets us know that you're protecting that waterway and you're allowing a certain boundary along that waterway so you do not disrupt that water table. Let me say something. Mm -hmm. in, in our plans, we, uh, we obviously advocate, advocate for streamside management zones or SMZs. In, in Texas, SMZs are actually voluntary. If we were in, say, South Carolina or North Carolina, I'd have a very different job. Um, I would actually be going out to your place telling you where you were going to have to put SMZs. So obviously in Texas, we don't like being told what to do. So we have, we have it set up to where um, they're, they're voluntary. But a streamside management zone is, is it's a buffer where you limit or maybe keep out forestry activities altogether within 50 feet of each side of the stream bank. Now that's a minimum of 50 feet. If you have a creek, say for instance, that's got some steep terrain or topography on either side of it, that buffer may increase. Again, SMZs are voluntary in the state, but it's uh, you know something I would if it was if I was a timberland owner, it's something that I would definitely have in my plan and something that I would observe because it's a pretty simple thing to observe. And this falls under prudent management, best management practices, not to clear cut a place all the way down to the lake or clear cut a place all the way down to the river or down to the, to the uh, creek or stream, okay? If you have a timber place if you have, and, and, and you continue to qualify for timber, you can take and cut the acreage out for what we're calling an SMZ or streamside management, or if you've got a small pond or lake that you're wanting to leave a buffer for the same reason, you can cut that acreage out of your timber track, apply for a streamside management designation on that, and that is a 50% on the, on the acreage that you set out for that SMZ, that's a 50% discount off of the timber appraised value. So it's your timber productive value half okay now there's some restrictions on the smz you can't go in there and, and, and you can't take advantage of that 50 percent break off of uh, off of the productivity appraisal and then clear cut it later on you can cut out of the smz but there's strict standards to how many uh, you can, basal you can feeds. thin selectively thin an smz down to uh, a certain density that's something you you know when, whenever we uh recommend folks harvest timber, we recommend they work with a consulting forester. You couldn't come to me, um, you can always come to me for advice and management plans, but if you wanted to cut your timber, I can't help you do that. That's up to a consultant. So a consulting forester is gonna know what density um, you can actually harvest trees in an SMZ. Some folks will, some folks will thin their SMZs, some folks will, they'll just leave them there for, for water quality and wildlife. Another option would also be at AMZ, the Aesthetic Management Zone. If you've ever gone down the road and you see that they've gone in and harvested timber, but they've left the strip along a roadway, that's for aesthetic purposes. That's going to be the same type of principle as an SMZ. It does require a separate um, application. And that's, again, same type of 50 percent um, uh, re reduce on that uh, appraisal. And that it just needs to be specified in your plan that that's that's what you're uh, managing that timber as. If you read some of my descriptions, and I don't know if I put it in this one or my other, that the way I describe an AMZ, that's so people from Houston to Dallas can drive down the road and not realize where wood and lumber come from. <laughs> they, you know, they they don't realize that it comes from actual trees that you cut. So you got nice, pretty roadways, and nobody ever realizes that you're killing a poor, innocent little tree. Okay. <laughs> Underbrush control. As you can see with this image, they have gone in and cleared out all the underbrush under these trees. Of course, this is going to allow sunlight into the stand and, and promote growth. This is essential with a, a timber stand because obviously you're going to want it to reach its potential. If you have the undergrowth, it's going to choke out the trees and you're not going to have um, a good quality timber stand. 
you want to talk about just some methods of doing that underbrush? There, there are uh, numerous methods for underbrush control, and uh, in my presentation in Rusk, I, you know, I showed some some different ones. Some can be expensive. Um, what what a lot of folks do is when they maybe thin their stand, do a selective thinning, you're going to earn some income. They'll come back and take the portion of that income, put it back into the property, use it maybe for using a, uh, having a mulching machine maybe come through there and clear underbrush, have um, herb maybe some kind of herbicide application if it's needed, uh, or prescription burning um, is, is definitely another one that, that I and I know that wildlife guys recommend because it's, it's a great wildlife tool as well. But the purpose of, that, of this underbrush control is to allow more soil nutrients and water to your crop trees, you know your trees that you're wanting to get bigger and bigger. The bigger these trees get, the heavier they are, the more money you're gonna make in the long run. And so um, if we were to write you a plan, we might recommend something, something like that. Doesn't mean you have to necessarily do it. Again, all we're gonna do is recommend actions for in, in the plan. It's gonna be between you and the appraisal district as to what you, what you decide to actually pursue. Can I ask a question that I may regret later? Yeah, you're, you're going to not like me for this. Um, can I put a herd of goats on my timber place to help control the undergrowth? Is that? That is, uh, that's a great, a great tool. I wish I knew more people that um, would do that. And I've heard of folks in the South uh, who, uh, who have goats, and they will take their, their goats and they'll go from track to track. Um, obviously, the track has Seriously? to be fenced. Really? You have to have a water res resource. I don't know of any actual vendors that do that. If somebody actually had goats and was willing to transport them from track to track, you could probably make a pretty decent living. But that's a great natural way of, of taking care of your, uh, your understory problem, cleaning up that brush. Might so be I, a good I could business opportunity if anyone's listening. <laughs> <laughs> goats for hire, yeah. But, 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 I, but I seriously could put goats on my place as far as my timber management plan as under, undergrowth control for real. Okay, well, turns out uh, you heard it from him. <laughs> Go get rent goats. <laughs> Maintaining roads and boundaries. As you can see here, um, this is going to have a defined line from the stand and the roadway. This is also kind of going to be a, a double usage here. They've planted it, which also could be a benefit for the wildlife here, as you can see. Ryegrass. Yes, ma'am. We'll get into a little bit more of that. And, and maintaining your boundaries could be that purple paint that the legislature said you could paint every 100 feet to maintain your boundaries. It could be a fence. Uh, just just nature. Google like uh, if you're on the the best best place I can tell you is just get, get on the internet and Google purple paint law um, Texas they basically if you have this purple paint on your place it, It's a way of trespassing of saying no trespassing and what works really good is if a logger say is harvesting timber next door and he cuts across your boundary and inadvertently accidentally cuts some of your timber if you have that purple paint up there not only are you going to be able to get him for the timber, but you're going to be able to get him for trespassing. It's going to make it a lot easier to, to state your case. So it works really well for timber theft cases also. And, and see, that's, that's why maintaining your boundaries is one of the timber management uh, activities, because of that very reason. It, it's, it's one of those things where you have maintained the boundaries so that you don't get some logger that may not be scrupulous or can't read signs and comes over into your place, then you've got standing in court. I'm sure everyone in here has heard of timber theft at some point and maybe have known someone or heard someone. So I will recommend the purple paint is essential, but I also have to let you know that the purple paint does wear. So that's going to be something that's going to be a maintenance that you do need to keep up with through the years. Um, so just doing it one time is probably not going to cut it. So I would just make sure that that is something that you you keep up with the boundaries of your stand and make sure that it's properly identified. So that is one of the easier ways of maintaining. Uh, it's not necessarily a difficult thing, but it is something that over time does wear. So it would be something I would definitely keep up with. Thank you, sir. Removal of dead or infected trees. 
obviously everyone knows that if you've got a timber stand that's a pretty expensive uh, operation and you're going to want to eliminate any disease or dead trees that could harm your, your growth. So uh, removal of the dead or infected trees is definitely going to be something that is encouraged to protect your investment. And that is one thing, going back to the comment earlier about can't we see the trees, we have no way of knowing whether you've actually gone out there and cut out infected or dead timber. So no, we can't see that. I mean, we could see the timber sitting there and wonder what you're going to do about it, but if you've already gone in there and harvested uh, or cut it out, we've got no idea that you did that without the timber management plan. Well, and I think part of what this was set up for originally, like in the timber sale manual, how many of y'all remember southern pine beetle outbreaks? Okay, so southern pine beetle is the most destructive uh, forest pest in the south, and when it when it when there is an outbreak, they will take out hundreds, if not thousands, they can take out thousands of acres. So part of this is like, uh, you know, back in the late 90s, I think, or I'm sorry, early 90s, it's before my time, um, in Cherokee County was the last time we had serious outbreaks. And at that time, folks were having loggers come in and remove infected trees and also remove a buffer of trees around those where the bugs were moving from tree to tree. So that kind of ties into that. Um, and then one other thing just uh, that I'd recommend, um, while you know, infected, dying, diseased trees, if they're not near the, the, the fence or the fire break, I probably wouldn't worry about them too much because they're great wildlife. Um, it's a great wildlife tool, management tool to leave dead snags there. But if it's something that's near your fire break or near your fence, those are the ones that we're concerned about um, removing, not just uh, from a forestry standpoint, but if there's a wildfire in the area, these dead trees that are near the house, near the roads, near the power lines, those are the ones that, that we have to deal with. And those are the ones that actually can start fires if they fall on power lines. So prompt removal of those kind of trees um, is what I'd recommend. Mm -hmm.